Hey everyone, back again. Let's continue on the Karl Marx train here with part two and part three, but this episode is just episode part two of part two and three of Capital. Wow, how much more time can I waste? Okay, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick of it. If you want to help me out, do all those things I just mentioned, like, share, subscribe. You can also help me out via Patreon or PayPal if that interests you at all. And uh, yeah, if you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find me on YouTube where I sometimes release videos. Or if you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously beneficial. Now, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's continue on here, starting with part two, the transformation of money into capital which throws us into chapter four, the general formula for capital. So if you remember from the last episode, if I had a shovel, I could sell it for $10 to get a pot. That corresponds to the following exchange or the following interaction where a commodity becomes money, which becomes a commodity. Now in capitalism or the general formula for capital, that is not enough. I need to instead, let's say I have $10. I'm going to use that $10 to buy a shovel for $10, but I'm going to now sell that shovel for $11. So in that process, I have now changed, transformed $10 into $11. So in this case, we have money becomes commodity, which becomes money prime. It's money with an additional, the same money with an additional bit attached to it. And this is the general form of capital. Now, this general form can also be reduced to just money becomes money prime. You know, we cut out the middle person of the commodity and it becomes money equals money prime. Money just somehow magically becomes more than itself. So this is how we earn surplus value. So if I have a money, let's say $10, through that process that I just outlined becomes $11, I have earned $1 of surplus value because the difference between 11 and $10 is $1. And this process is limitless. And that is exactly the intent of this whole system. It is to grow. It is to elevate things for the sake of elevating them, because this is how profit and surplus is earned. And these two things are different. Profit and surplus are different. I'm just, you know, to be quite simple, using them interchangeably here, but we're really talking about surplus. And it is at this moment that we can earn the surplus that the capitalist is born. And we're going to get more into this history of capitalism in the fourth episode I do on this. But for now, this is how the capitalist is born. Someone who's disinterested in use value and instead only interested in the limitless procurement, the limitless, um, uh, I guess, accruement or uh, collecting of surplus value. And so here, as I presented in the last episode, the kind of contradiction between the necessity to hold on to one's money and the necessity to spend it is resolved because now spending money, me spending the $10 on the shovel that I now sell for 11, spending actually earns me money. And that puts us here into chapter five, contradictions in the general formula. As the title suggests, he's gonna present the issues with this. Now, if you recall in the previous arrangement where if we had a commodity and we sold it for money, we could get another commodity, shovel equals $10 equals pot, for example, the socially objectified labor underneath it or socially necessary labor power underneath all of these things stays the same. So $10 is equal to a pot, which is equal to um, a, the shovel. But in this case, now when more money is made from selling a thing, what we are saying is that value seems to change without any change in the socially necessary labor that was required to make the things to bring them to market. So surplus value is kind of an illusion, this extra $1 made on top of the original $10. It's kind of illusion, it's, it's fairy dust, it's magic almost, because value can't be created in circulation. Value must be attached to labor. But at the same time, Value can only be properly measured within circulation. And this is another contradiction here because value is both attached to labor, but
but it only finds its existence within exchange within the market. So capital is then, for Marx, it must have its origin both in circulation and outside or not in circulation. And it's all, for him, it's all very mysterious. And I think that he's very, he's right about this. It is a very mysterious, fantastical thing that allows value to come out of nothing at all. Because I can then take that $11 with that $1 surplus going from 10 to $11. And now I can buy $11 worth of socially necessary labor time. But I didn't sell that amount to get there. So there is a growing detachment between the exchange value of things and the you and the sorry and the socially necessary labor power underneath them. And with this gulf, with this uh, splitting apart, the separation of the measured value of things in terms of dollars in the market and the socially necessary labor time underneath it, the more prone the system will be to collapse because it will grow more and more unsteady. It's like, for example, if I have a drone and I'm, you know, I'm sitting on the beach with a little drone and I have the controller in my hand. The further away I send that drone, the more and more likely it will be to crash, probably into the water and I'll lose it forever, because it is losing its attachment to the thing that is controlling it, to, to the thing that is limiting it, yet giving it, uh, letting it fly at all, giving it a kind of power, giving it its potential. And that puts us here into chapter six the sale and purchase of labor power. So when a commodity is bought, the labor power that was necessary to go into it is being bought. And so labor power is itself a commodity. So I'm a free person. I could go to McDonald's and say, I will work for you. I will give you my labor power. In that moment, I am selling my labor power for whatever minimum wage is, because we know McDonald's is probably gonna pay people minimum wage at least in some places and at some ranks. I don't know. I don't want to get sued. It, maybe that's the case all the time. Who knows? Let's say, for example, McDonald's is going to give me $10 an hour as minimum wage. What I am agreeing to is that my labor is worth $10 an hour. And so in this paradigm, in this situation, there are people with capital who can buy labor power from other people which has been kind of set or regulated by the market. And this stage, this possibility of buying people's labor power as a commodity only comes in with an effective separation between the use value of commodities and their exchange value, where value has been kind of, um, has been accrued. We've earned more value from less use, from less in this case, even socially necessary labor power, because it is in that process that someone is actually able to earn more money than they spend on making a thing. And it is with that. So let me sketch this out maybe a little better. If I make coats, my goal is to earn money off of the coats. So we think about the process I just laid out. I sell a coat, I make $10. I then say, okay, I need to turn this $10 into $11 without just putting more things to work, hiring an employee that's going to raise the price of a thing, whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to do that because then I'm just breaking even. I need to find a way to earn money without incurring more cost, without elevating my cost. And with that potential comes the possibility to have more disposable money that can then be used to put back into your production of coats or whatever you're making whether it be hiring employees or hiring new or putting uh, into operation new equipment that are going that work more efficiently, whatever, what that is doing then is allowing me to earn enough to hire other people, which wouldn't have been possible if all I was doing was just earning enough for my own survival, for my own use. If I just made things for my own use, I wouldn't need to hire other people to make them because uh, or at least I wouldn't be able to have them sell me their labor, they would be um, they would be weighing the value of their own labor and their own expertise. So if I needed a shovel, I'd go to someone someone else down the road who makes shovels, and they're going to charge me what they've kind of valued their own labor at in terms of that shovel. They aren't just selling me their time or their specific labor to make me a thing, as in the case of wage laborers. So the value that has to be paid to laborers, and I've already 
kind of uh, spoken about this, the value that has to be paid to them is has to be equal to or greater than the necessary amount to keep them alive. So the amount that's going to be required for them to keep working, that'll cover food and shelter and so on. So for the worker, they need to earn X number of dollars. Let's say in a day, they need to earn $40 to cover their food and to cover their housing. And this is just purely hypothetical. I don't know, it, this probably isn't true anywhere, but let's say someone is working at McDonald's earning $10 an hour and they work for eight hours. In that eight hours, and we're factoring out taxes here and other fees, anything like that, in that eight hours, they are going to earn $80. But it costs them 40 to, uh, to keep themselves alive, to pay for food, to pay for shelter, in order to allow them to keep working. So the capitalist must pay them the $40 in the first four hours of work because it's $10 an hour. And everything beyond that, the laborer is giving more than they need. So after four hours, the laborer has essentially earned what they need to live. But the capitalist, the person that hires them, has them keep working. And it is in those extra four hours that they are earning a surplus for the capitalist. So their labor after those first four hours that are used to cover their cost of living, everything beyond that is just earning value for the capitalist, not for the worker. Now we're going to talk about this a lot more as we go on, but he introduces a break here. And now we're into part three, the production of absolute surplus value. And chapter seven, the labor process and the valorization process. So the labor process can be broken into three parts. There's purposeful activity, there's what is exerted upon objects, and there is what is done with the instruments of labor, the, the objects that we have in order to, like tools, to work on that labor or to perform that labor. And these are, like tools are really objects and they only become raw material when they are worked on with labor. Nothing in the world is raw material until humans operate on it with labor, with their own labor. So labor demands tools as use values. So the capitalist is going to be buying things like machinery or hammers or whatever tools in order to make them more money that their workers are going to put to use. So in this case, Marx writes that products are therefore not only the result of labor, labor doesn't only make things, they are necessary, uh, they are uh, the essential conditions of labor as well. So we need products in order to make labor work. We need products in the factory, in the workshop, whatever, but we also need products in order to use to feed and to keep workers alive. They have to, um, they have to, they have to eat, they have to have shelter, they have to have clothing and so on. So in this labor process, it introduces two kind of characteristic phenomena or contains two characteristic phenomena that is in the capitalist labor process. Firstly, the worker works under the capitalist who wants the worker to be as efficient as humanly possible with their labor and with the raw materials they are using. And secondly, everything that the worker makes is not of the workers, uh, is owned by the capitalist, sorry. Everything that the worker makes is owned by the capitalist. And these reflect the capitalist's two primary interests. And that is to make objects that will have use value for someone and that can therefore be sold. So the capitalist wants to make things that people will buy because they will see them as having some kind of use for themselves. And secondly, he wants to sell them or they want to sell them at a profit in order to make surplus value, which can then be used to put back into the production process in order to make more surplus value and more and more and more. So the value of an object in a rather simple formation is going to be determined by the cost of labor, the cost of raw materials, the cost of other things like taxes, the cost of uh, like property tax, the, the cost of buildings, the cost of wear and tear. The value of a thing is going to be determined by all of those factors. But value can turn into valorization when suddenly things are sold for more than all of those costs combined. So this is the introduction of the system of, you know, earning profit, of capital, when values are attained from objects that are sold that go beyond 
the labor and raw materials, and remember, raw materials are just labor, just labor in objective, um, in uh, as as objects. Everything being labor, it is when value somehow goes beyond the labor required to make a thing. So there is a kind of dual alienation going on here. On the one hand, every minute that the worker works beyond what was required to satisfy their needs, every minute they are producing things, those things being produced weren't necessary for them to produce. They're just doing it in order to appease the capitalist. Now, the second form of alienation occurs when the thing then is valued at greater than the labor power necessary to go into it, which marks and sort of instigates a lessening of the value of labor, because now that labor is represented in less money or less kind of real value, but it is sold for more. So there's a kind of inflation occurring here. And that puts us into chapter eight, constant capital and variable capital. So commodities values are the sum of everything required to go into them. Uh, like, as I said, labor, raw materials, wear and tear, tax, every, everything like that uh, will determine the value of an object. But then the capitalist sells it for more because they want to earn more money. So if it takes weaver, a weaver, for example, six hours to weave something, but then they learn how to do it 10 times faster, they will be able to make 10 times the number of things that they're weaving. So the value stays the same because the human labor going into the thing stays the same, but they just found a faster way to do it. But that value is now divided across more produced objects than before. So let's say in the six hours, the weaver weaved, I don't know, five things, whatever, just bear with me. They weaved five things or even easier. They weaved one thing. That six hours of labor was then found in that one thing. But let's say, for instance, the weaver suddenly found a technique, uh, a very simple one, maybe they move their hands a little differently, and they can make 10 times the amount of things, or the number of things. They now make 10 things in six hours, which means that six hours labor is not found in one thing, it is found in 10 things. So the value of those things have now come down because there has been less value, uh, it's been the same value spread across more of them. So in the case of tools, for example, if I have a tool, uh, let's say I have a hammer that is being used, I use a hammer to make, um, to put a chair together. I'm going to factor in the cost of the hammer into the chairs. Now I'm just going to say something that a totally ridiculous example, but I'm using it just so it's as easy to understand as possible. Let's say a hammer costs me $10 and with it, I know I'm going to be able to make 10 chairs. You, you'll be able to make way more than that, but I just want to make this as easy as possible. Let's say I'll be able to make it for 10 chairs. I need to price at least $1 to each of those chairs in order to cover the cost of the hammer. Because the hammer cost me $10, it will last me 10 chairs, so therefore each chair needs to be charged at least $1 of its value in the market needs to be uh, used to, against the cost of the hammer or else I will lose money. So in the case of the hammer, because I only add a dollar to each object to cover the cost of the hammer, the hammer doesn't actually earn me more value. No value is created by the hammer because I am only charging enough to cover the cost of the hammer. And the same applies to machinery. Let's say a big machine will make me, um, I don't know, a hundred pieces of linen, what, you know, whatever the example, then I need to factor in a hundred pieces of linen or, or the cost of that machine into a hundred pieces of linen so that I make my money back on the cost of the machine. And so he says here that tools and the means of production like uh, machines don't create value. Only living labor creates value because I can only charge as much for the thing that I'm selling as is represented in the cost of the tools used to make it. Because someone down the road can just, if, they, if there was anyone else in the town, for example, that had the same tool, 
we could just bring the prices down to the absolute minimum just to break even, and then there's nothing more we can do with it. Whereas with living human labor, you can make humans work harder, and you can make humans work longer, and you can make humans earn less to the point that they might die because you're paying them as less than what they need to survive, and then you'll just rely on other uh, laborers and so on. So he's very adamant on this point that tools and the means of production do not produce value, only real human labor does. And this is also tied to the fact that all of these objects, tools and the means of production and so on, are themselves only labor. They were only made through labor. They didn't just spontaneously fall down from the sky. They were created through labor. So when you buy them, you aren't paying the hammer to let you use the hammer. You are paying humans to let you use the hammer. So he calls the means of production and tools and all that, he calls that constant capital, whereas he calls living labor variable capital. And this comes out of Ricardo and Smith as well. Variable capital is what you're going to be spending on things that are coming in and out of the door quite often. Whereas constant capital, you can assume you're going to have it. You, you spend a thousand dollars on a machine and you calculate the cost of that machine and put that in order to break even, you put that cost into uh, into the objects that it is helping to make. And I'm sure that many of you have heard discussions about the, the concern for automation and how automation is going to threaten um, workers. And it, and it does. There's, there's no doubt about that. Even David Ricardo is very concerned about the use of machines and how it gets rid of laborers. But that can only happen to a certain point because the people who own the machines are still going to need a population of people to buy those objects. They're still going to need people that are earning money that can buy the things the machines are making. Now, with that being said, it doesn't mean it's still not going to pose a problem. It absolutely will. But it can only go so far. And this also explains why despite maybe in North America and Europe, automation is a big thing. But a lot of these countries, or sorry, a lot of these or many of these companies that are automating also rely quite heavily upon very cheap um, sweatshop style labor in other parts of the world. They rely upon labor because that is the place from which value is still created, not from machines that only represent constant capital. So there's always going to be this reliance upon living labor as variable capital because that is where value comes from. All value originates from labor. And that puts us here into chapter 9, the rate of surplus value. So constant plus variable capital equals capital with a, with a capital C. It equals the amount the capitalist is going to make that they could then put back into the system in order to make them even more capital, even more surplus value. So capital is equal to constant plus variable capital, which is represented by the equation big C is equal to C plus V or constant plus variable. But if you recall, capital must actually be greater than the sum required to make it or to produce it, to earn it. So we must actually create more capital than just what constant plus variable capital will get us. So what we earn, what the capitalist earns has to be greater or what they sell their products for has to be greater than the cost of labor plus the cost of machines, wear and tear, all that has to be greater than that. So what we actually have instead is capital is greater than C plus V or constant plus variable capital. So wh where does this extra sum come from? Well, he says that this is the surplus value. This is the extra that you are able to get out of the humans working for you that is going to make you more money. And we can, uh, we can look at, we can figure out surplus value if we add constant capital together plus variable capital plus all other costs that are supposed to be uh, made up for in the sale of a product or a service or whatever, if we calculate all of that and we see that we are selling products for more, that is the total sum of all the products sold is more than that, if we were to subtract that new sum, that sum that is sold to earn a profit, from what is just required to cover all the costs, if we subtract those two, the difference is the surplus value that is extracted, that additional amount that is that the objects are sold for in order to make more than they cost. 
But we can simplify this even more because we know that surplus value is only taken out of humans. It isn't taken out of machines because you can't make a machine work harder than it, it was made to work. Uh, maybe someone can figure out a way to make some machine work better if they, I don't know, hit one part of it with a hammer. Maybe it'll magically make the machine work better, but that would only be a short-term solution to the problem. Eventually then someone else down the road is going to figure it out and then they're going to be able to do it. And then they'll have to bring their prices down in terms of the machine costs or what value of the machine is reflected in the price of things they're selling. They're going to have to bring down those costs in order to be competitive. So we know then that only value or sorry, only human labor can produce this surplus value. So that means then that I guess labor and surplus value have some kind of relationship to one another. So whatever the value of surplus value is that we have calculated, and this is capital, the capital we sell it for, the price of something we, 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 the price of something we sell minus the cost to make it, that is, uh, that is capital or that is capital prime, the difference, that is surplus value. If we calculate that number, let's say it costs $10 to make a broom, but I sell it for $11. I've made a dollar of surplus value. Now that cost is, that dollar is what is called the absolute surplus value. That's just the dollar amount of the surplus value. Whereas relative surplus value is its proportion to variable capital. It's, in other words, it is its proportion to the value, to the cost of living human labor. So if the cost of labor goes up, but surplus value stays the same or even goes down, then that's bad for the capitalists because now they are earning less surplus on what they are making and they're having to pay their workers more. So remember how the workers needs to work in the McDonald's example I gave earlier. They work four hours to earn enough to cover the cost of living and all that. It's not true. That's a laughable uh, equation, but let's pretend it's the case. Then the next four hours is surplus labor time. That is the um, uh, exploited amount that goes to the capitalist. So in this case, four hours are spent for necessary labor time, what the worker needs in order to survive. And then four hours are spent on, on surplus labor time. This signals a rate of exploitation of 100% because we have four to four. We have four hours spent on necessary labor time and then four hours that the worker keeps working in order to uh, earn money for the capitalists, not for themselves. Four to four, 100%. Now, if it was, for example, two hours were spent on necessary labor time, whereas um, six hours was spent on socially necessary labor time, the rate of exploitation would be much higher because way more of the time is spent exploiting the worker than it is spent on recuperating the, the worker's cost for themselves. Now let's put this into actual numbers to make it real. So let's say it's $40, the four hours, to make up for, at least if we have $10 an hour, to make up for what the worker needs to survive. We can't underestimate the evil that comes out of this system. So the capitalists will say, I can just pay the worker $40 for eight hours of work, and then they're going to earn what they need to survive, and they're going to be able to keep coming back to work. Maybe I'll even give them a little bit extra. But the point is that now the necessary uh, amount that the worker has to be made is spread over eight hours. So they're making $40 in eight hours. So in four hours of labor time, they aren't actually earning or making back what they need to survive. They're only making it back after eight hours, but they are making the capitalists so much more that uh, they're able, the capitalist is then able to extract a great deal of extra value out of the labor being given to them because they're only paying the bare minimum to the workers that are working for them. And they are, like in the example I provided earlier, in the case earlier, where let's say the capitalist was able to find out a way to, or let's say people's cost of living can be actually be covered in two hours based off of what the capitalist actually has the money to afford. They say, okay, let me just then pay them $20, if it's $10 an hour, let's say, 
over the course of eight hours. And now they're going to make those $20. They're going to survive. They'll be somewhat, you know, happy, but they're earning me way more than that. And so the capitalists can use this to then extract so much more labor, so much more value out of the worker than the worker uh, is getting in return. And that puts us here into chapter 10, the working day. So if it takes, for example, six hours to pay worker their necessary labor, or in the case that I already presented, four hours to cover the cost of living, uh, expenses and all that, anything above that is surplus. And so the capitalist wants to maximize that surplus while minimizing the necessary labor time. So they want the worker to only require to work for two hours while still making them work for eight. So the worker is losing their time, you know, they're selling their time to somebody who's making more from them than they are making for themselves. And it is in this way that Marx likens the capitalist to a vampire because they suck living labor, they suck labor, they suck energy, they suck value out of the worker. So one of the ways that the capitalist can do this is by saying, okay, in eight hours, four hours are spent covering necessary cost for you. Uh, what I want to do then is raise the working day or lengthen the working day to 10 hours. So now four hours are spent covering necessary costs for the worker, while six hours instead of four now are spent on necessary labor. So if we look at that proportion, it is now not four to four. The rate of exploitation is now uh, four to six. So there's a lot more I think that's, I don't know, a 33% increase, give or take, in exploitation. So instead of 100%, it's 133%. So another way that the capitalist might do this is by never having the factory shut off. So you have people working for a 12-hour shift, and then instead of you know having no one work all night, you then hire people to work at night, which is a way to keep hours going. Also, you might um, you might hire children who you can justify to pay for less. You might hire even women who at the time and even very much to this day are justified being paid less based off of the social condition in which um, these economic conditions emerge. And many workers, many, many people fought very hard to have the working day reduced from, and Marx provides so many examples. In fact, you know, I think he kind of goes overboard. It's like, man, we get it. Like the conditions were really bad. But he presents numerous examples of people working 60 and 17 hour days, not including the amount of time required to get to work because they often live far and they have to walk very far, working these extremely long days in absolutely horrible conditions because the capitalist really doesn't care about the workers so long as they are earning the capitalist surplus value. And so there was this antagonism, this kind of dialectic, this kind of struggle between workers and capitalists. A, a very strong back and forth. So if the workers were, for example, they may have been successful at reducing the number of working hours in a day, but then the capitalist might respond by saying, okay, screw you, I'm just going to pay you less. I'm going to reduce your wages. And so there was, uh, in this case, the capitalists had all the power, even though they represented the minority of the population. And as we'll come to see in episode four, they had the government on their side as well and other institutions in order to keep the people in line, to allow exploitation to occur. So that puts us here into chapter 11, the rate and mass of surplus value. So if it takes six hours to cover the worker's subsistence, or four hours in the example I gave earlier, and those four hours cost the capitalist $40, let's $10 an hour, then one labor power equals $40. Or if the capitalist wants to pull a, a really good trick, they will just value the labor, uh, the laborer's value. Let's say um, laborers need to work because of the conditions created by the capitalist economy by driving them out of their homes. And we'll talk about this more in chapter four. The laborer needs to work. And the capitalist says, okay, this laborer needs to make $40 in order to live. So they have to be paid that or else I won't have workers. So it would cost me, they're going to earn me $40 after four hours in what they are making. So they're going to make, uh, they might make, I don't know, shovels. Sorry for the shovel thing. I don't know. Shovels are just first thing that come to my mind. 
after four hours, they are going to make me $40 worth of shovels. So I'm going to give that back to them after four hours, but I'm going to make them keep working for four extra hours. So I'm going to say that in eight hours, they're only going to get paid $40. But that $40 just covered the first four hours of their working. And the next four hours, and we're going to talk about this more in chapter three, I believe, um, or, in, or in part three, episode three, those extra four hours are essentially unpaid then because they are only earning what they have made in that first little bit in the first four hours. So their labor power, one labor power, what they can do in a day is $40 worth. They earn $40 for the capitalist. So we can then calculate the surplus value or the mass of the surplus value accumulated by adding together the amount produced, the number of things produced by the exploited workers, plus the degree of the exploitation of those workers. So how hard are they forced to work? So this could be further divided or represented in equations that I'm going to try and explain really as easily as possible. So the mass of surplus value is equal to, sur uh, is equal to surplus value over variable value. Sorry, is equal to surplus labor over the amount that is paid to the worker, which is obviously less, times the total amount of paid workers. So the total amount of people actually working. Now it is that, the total mass of uh, surplus value, plus the total labor power multiplied by the surplus labor over the necessary labor time the number, times the number of workers. Now I'm just putting that out there. It's You don't have to sit down and write these down. The point is that the mass of surplus value can be calculated by looking at the degree of exploitation of workers times the number of workers, essentially. Also factor in how hard those workers are forced to work and how productive they are. Now in this equation, any one of these factors might increase, in which case other parts of the equation might go down. So there is a relationship between each if workers are forced to work harder, that might mean that fewer workers are necessary. But at the same time, they can be forced to work harder and then the capitalist could say, oh, I better hire more to earn even more. And so there is this kind of relationship between the, uh, each. Now, workers in this situation become for Marx what he describes as a kind of living dead. They become zombies. While the machinery around them, the machines, of, the, the means of production, they, they come alive while the workers become dead, where the means of production view the workers as the ferment necessary to their own life process, the life process of self-valorization. So the worker only becomes then what he calls an appendage to the machine. All they are doing is working like machines in order to keep machines alive. And this is one of the kind of motivating factors behind keeping the working day as long as possible so that machines are always left on. You don't have to, because at the time he's describing this in industrialization when people were, it would take a long time to maybe start up machines to cool them down and, and so on. So now he didn't have to worry about that at all. The machines can keep doing what they're doing while humans are made to work at the level of the machine. They, be, they have to become machines to keep up with the machines. But despite this, keep in mind that it is still living labor, still variable capital, still workers that are earning value. But they, there's this kind of dehumanization that occurs in the entire process. And yeah, that'll wrap this one up here at the end of part three. Next time, we're going to start with part four, the production of relative surplus value, and also then therefore chapter 12, the concept of relative surplus value. So yeah, if you made it this far, I hope that you like what I did. If there's anything I... Uh, maybe it wasn't so clear about. I'd love to hear about it. Um, anything that I missed, I'd love to hear about it. Or anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows, they might get a kick out of it. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. Take care.